Now, I'm going to turn to something uh, that's been very much on our minds as a commission and is a really uh, uh, a very sad moment for our commission. Um, and that, but I want to move from the sadness to reflecting on our loss. And the loss is of a beloved former commission member, Dr. John Aris, who passed away on March 9th. We were honored to have John as a thoroughly engaged, thoughtful, intellectually provocative, and endlessly good-humored colleague on the commission for the past five years. You see some pictures of John here. He enlivened our deliberations, and he contributed far more than his share to our painstaking work. And I um, say with no qualification that never, even when John was in pain, and he was in pain through some of this time, never did he approach this work as painstaking. He approached it with the greatest verve and good humor. He was the Porterfield Professor of Biomedical Ethics and Professor of Philosophy and Public Health Sciences at the University of Virginia, where he also directed its exemplary undergraduate program in bioethics. And prior to this, he was on the faculties of the University of the Redlands, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Yeshiva University, and he served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone. John was a consummate teacher. And he was an expert, caring teacher. He won prestigious teaching awards, but as meaningful, he received innumerable tributes from former students who vividly described his generosity as a teacher, his willingness to engage with them, and to treat them with the respect of equal partners in intellectual debate. And if you knew anything about John, you knew he loved to debate. And I emphasize the love as much as the debate. So when you were in a debate with John, you enjoyed it because he enjoyed it. And you knew it wasn't about winning and losing. It was about moving forward and learning. Um, we have called uh, John, and he uh, his, his wife has actually said he would love this. He was a, he was a Socratic gadfly. He loved to test um, the truth. Um, and he himself described his relation to teaching, and I quote, as a kind of secular blessedness, to love what you do over a very long stretch of time. That's as good as it gets. As a lover of learning and seeker of justice for all, John Aris was as good as we can ever hope to get. We are grieving the tremendous loss of a great teacher, scholar, and member of our bioethics family, and we already greatly miss him, but we will never forget him, and we will carry his spirit on. And in that spirit, I want to ask John's close friend and colleague, Dr. Thomas Murray, to share his reflections on John and his rich contribution to the field of bioethics. Tom, if you would come up here. and Let me just briefly introduce uh, Tom. So Tom, as I know him, I've known him for many, many years and respected his work as president emeritus. He is now of the Hastings Center, and he is now a visiting centennial professor in medical ethics at the School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore. He served as president and CEO of the Hastings Center from 1999 until 2012. And from 1996 through 2001, very relevant to us, he served on the National Bioethics Advisory Commission and as chair of its genetics subcommittee. Tom's research interests include ethics and genetics as well as ethical issues in sports, and he has actually written about the widest range of issues in bioethics. Welcome, Dr. Murray. Uh, thanks so much. Um, it's an honor to be speaking before the commission. Um, 
a really a particularly great honor because it's in memory of my very dear friend, uh, John Aris, and I have other very dear friends who are on this commission, so it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, as a philosopher, my job is to make life more difficult for people. Uh, that's John. Uh, it's a passage from his uh, new book that's not officially in press yet, but uh, we think will be soon, The Ways We Reason Now, Skeptical Reflections on Method and Bioethics. Uh, this is a very serious challenge you've given me. How am I going to reconcile our memories of John because he could indeed make life more difficult for you. Yes, he loved to debate, and sometimes that's unsettling. Uh, he could particularly make, make life difficult if your actions or character were defective in his eyes, if you misuse power, or, or if your ideas were sloppy. He didn't have a lot of patience for any of that. But how do we reconcile that with the John that we loved? Uh, for many reasons. His enco encompassing sense of humor John wielded the skewer of humor more skillfully than any human being I've ever known. Uh, I'm sure I've been the target of it, but he, uh, he welded it most often against himself. Uh, now, this is being broadcast, I guess, so I can't use the actual expression John used. I'll just use the uh, initials SFB, and I can tell you that the last two are four brains. You can fill in the blank. He often referred to himself in those terms, and it's become a family favorite for us, too. He saw the absurd in the details of everyday life, could describe it colorfully and hilariously. John was also devoted to his family, to Liz Emery, his wife of 47 years, his children, uh, Melissa, Melissa and Marina. He cared deeply about teaching, as Amy has said, and about his students at individuals. I was, um, uh, we can't, Cynthia and I made it to the memorial service at UVA. We just thought we had to do that. Whatever barriers there were, we just had to go. Uh, and I heard some absolutely wonderful reflections, particularly from John's students, current and former students, including uh, Elizabeth Fenton, who uh, is a staff of this commission, who, about whom he could not say uh, greater things. He just loved Elizabeth. John was also a loyal and abiding friend. He was with you in your happiness, and he grieved deeply with you at your losses, and we've, we've known both, and he's been with us at all times. Now, the only way I can convey, at least I can convey, who he was, as I understand him, is through the story of our friendship. We met uh, under the most unpromising circumstances imaginable, we met as rivals for uh, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. We both really wanted. Uh, and we met at the Ardsley Acres Motel, which was said to rent rooms by the hour. Amy's been there. Um, yes. Uh, and, oh yeah. Uh, CD would be an upgrade uh, for the Ardsley Acres Motel. Um, I, I venture that uh, there may be no other people who 36, there was a 37 years later, uh, who first met at the Ardsley Acres Motel who were still friends or even acknowledge each other's existence uh, that many years later. So we had, uh, we had, we went from there uh, and had a wonderful year together as we both got the fellowship at the Hastings Center along with another dear uh, late friend, Nancy Roden. So I learned a lot about John. John and his family liked to travel. He told one story about a cross-country drive uh, when his daughters were in the back seat playing with his hair, and then he gets out of the car, uh, I guess at a, a gas station, and he's receiving these curious looks. And he realizes that his daughters had decorated his, his hair liberally with barrettes. So you see, he had as much or more hair, well, more hair back then. Uh, he, just, he loved to be, he loved fishing for trout. He was a fly fisherman. He describes on one of these trips uh, finding a place that was just, the fishing was just fabulous until the people started running at him and screaming because he was actually fishing in a hatchery. So that would be, that would be typical of John. Uh, in that first year together, the Hastings Center was, we felt a little bit of a stuffy place, so we created a, a weekly occasion. We called it pizza night. We would just, anybody, staff, anybody who wanted to come, 
threw on a buck or so, and we'd ordered some pizzas from the local pizzeria and uh, just hang out after work and talk. And the children, the children were invited, so you have to imagine a scene of nearly complete chaos with young children running down to photocopy parts of their bodies, crawling under the tables around which the meetings would usually be held, pizzas strewn across the table, uh, loud laughter uh, from the group there. In walked a Canadian philosopher whose name, blessedly, I can't remember. Uh, he just spent something like six months or a year at either Oxford or Cambridge. And he walks into the scene of you know, utter chaos. John doesn't miss a beat. He says, hi, I'm John Aris. This is Liz Emery, the woman I live with, and these are our children, Saffron and Free. Uh, I couldn't catch my breath, but that was, that was John. Uh, quicker than anybody I've ever known. Uh, there is one little known fact that I will share with this group. John owes all of his success to me. There's a direct causal link. Uh, in that year together as fellows, uh, Neither of us had a sport coat. I went out and bought one at you know, whatever the discount place was. Every time John had a job interview, he borrowed my sport coat. So there's a but-for condition. Um, he, he did uh, grow beyond that, however. Our families grew very close that year, sometimes too close. Uh, there was a, a day when our, his daughter, uh, Marina, and our daughter, Nikki, were in the same class at the local school. And on the playground, they bumped heads, and Nikki came home and reported that uh, uh, Melissa had to leave school with a possible pin cushion. Um, uh, our daughter Emily was born that year, and Liz stayed with uh, our son Pete and our daughter Nikki uh, when we when uh, we uh, decided Emily should be baptized. We decided to baptize also Pete and Nikki, and Pete wanted John to be his godfather, which we thought was a lovely thing. John was an atheist, so he found that you know he demurred with great regret, but it was just hard to be a godfather at a christening if given his beliefs. Um, there was a, a, an anniversary party that our daughter Nikki at age uh, 11 and a half organized, uh, a sixth anniversary party, surprise party for Cynthia and me at our house, uh, and she pulled it off. John and Liz, she told, bring a main course for 25. And sure enough, they showed up with a roast turkey, and it was more than enough. Um, there were stories also that I have a more direct bioethics connection. Uh, there was a time when I was in uh, the hospital, Montefiore, where John then worked. Um, he had given an interview to the New York Times where he'd been challenged by the reporter who said, you know, some people think life is a gift from God, and to ever, you know, turn down that gift would be wrong. And John said, well, I, I prefer to think of God as a benevolent innkeeper. And if the stay gets really unpleasant, you can check out. Right after this was published, John walked into the hospital room where I was. I'm very proud of this. I grabbed the pillow, I held it up in front of me and said, oh no, it's Dr. Checkout. He enjoyed that. He also sat through an informed consent procedure, uh, informed consent for a procedure, uh, quietly in a corner of the room. And when the, uh, the young physician left, I think she was a fellow, he could not talk. He was laughing so hard. It had been a very nice informed consent procedure. She'd gone through all the details and asked for, if I had any questions. Uh, he said, he finally gasped, they know who you are. Uh, he said, I've never seen anything like that before. Um, and after the surgery, uh, John and another friend took uh, Cynthia I was not looking very good at the moment, took her to lunch. Now, I, you know, one could think that this was a very inappropriate time to make a move on a man's wife, but uh, John wouldn't probably do that. But then I found out just yesterday that he signed all his emails to Cynthia, love and kisses. Um, so, but it's a little late to worry about that right now. Um, we learned some things that, I learned some things at the UVA memorial service. Uh, Liz, his, widow now, worked for many years as a minister, which is ordained in the American Baptist Church. In 2002, she founded something called the, the New Beginnings Christian Community. This is Liz's description of her own ministry. To ex-offenders, people with HIV, AIDS, alcoholics, addicts, refugees, and the homeless. The choir of the NBCC sang at John's memorial service. 
in every conversation I ever had with John, he, so his support for Liz and her mission never wavered. Uh, I'm guessing he, he has done so much that we will never know about, so many small acts of kindness, that I, I've gotten hints of some of them. Uh, I also suspect that they, the people in that community probably knew him as Pastor Liz's husband. They may have had no idea that he was a distinguished professor at the University of Virginia. And by the way, his own title for his chair was the Lazy Boy Reclining Chair of Bioethics at the University of Virginia. Now to John as a scholar. So in preparation for this, I read the manuscript for his forthcoming book, more in a moment. I also searched all of his publications on Google, using Google Scholar. I was very excited to find a patent when I did that search on hydraulic power transmission. However, it was the wrong heiress, so we'll have to just pass over that one. But, but here's what I learned about John's scholarship. He resisted chasing the shiny object. This is a problem that many of us in bioethics have had from time to time, the, the fascinating new technology. He never cared about that. Um, in fact, you could describe his scholarship in three categories. One is doing things helpful to teachers and students, ethical issues in modern medicine, his readings collection, now in its, at least its eighth edition is testament to that. The biggest category were issues that genuinely mattered to people now. HIV AIDS, how we die, advanced directives, physician assisted suicide, family autonomy, persistent vegetative state, treatment and non-treatment decisions for imperiled newborns, organ transplantation, how to respond to public health emergencies, how do you, for example, do you ration a vaccine in an epidemic, High-tech home care, John was one of the first scholars to really think about what it meant to move the hospital and its equipment from that setting to a home setting. Fair benefits in international research and rights, justice, and access to health care, that people should have access to health care. He cared mostly about the things that mattered most to people here and now, and I have great respect for that. The third category, the final category, is he was not content with just thinking about these vital and vexed issues, but John reflected critically on, how, he would say skeptically, on how we think about them. Of all the contributions I think John has made as a scholar, I suspect the most influential and enduring will be his trenchant, insightful reflections on method and theory in bioethics, on how we do practical moral reasoning about these very complex issues. Uh, I think I'll end by reading one quote from the book. Um, this is from chapter nine. Uh, if all interpretive activity within the field were to depend upon the selection of a single superior moral political theory, practitioners hoping for assistance in dealing with real world clinical or policy problems would have to suffer a very long wait indeed and then he has in parentheses, be right with you as soon as we resolve the fundamental disagreements between consequentialists and deontologists. Uh, and as anybody here with a background of philosophy knows, that ain't gonna happen anytime soon, if ever. Uh, I love John, I miss him terribly, but I will never think of him without smiling because he brought such grace and good humor into our lives. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, thank you. And I'd just like to open it up if any commission members would like to say anything personal or professional about John. And I see Christine not nodding, so Christine. So I can't be as eloquent as Tom or Amy, but I wanted to reflect a little bit. Um, I knew John actually before the commission and was privileged to be his colleague both at the Hastings and ASBH and at the NIH. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about his role on the commission from my perspective, um, and especially in light of what we're going to talk about today. So I think, as everyone knows, he was intellectually sharp and rigorous, funny and provocative, and just wonderful to have as part of any discussion. But his contributions to the commission's work were, were pretty enormous. I mean, I think he really, he always found an issue which piqued his interest, and he would pursue it with a wealth of knowledge, with incisiveness and insight, and a twinkle in his eye, always a twinkle in his eye. Um, and as Amy said, he loved debate. He loved deliberation and debate. 
Um, I was reading about, I was reading some of the articles for today, and the, the article, the famous article that Amy and Dennis Thompson wrote in the Hastings Center some years back on deliberative democracy, talks about um, how important the players are, as the deliberators are. And so I'm going to quote one sentence from that because I think it reminds me of John. And not that John didn't have strong opinions, he had very strong opinions, but he was open. He was open to hearing others. So this quote is, Diversity of voices are not only or even the most important factor in deliberative democracy. The will of the deliberators themselves is critical. They must be willing to broaden their perspective in light of what they hear in the deliberative process. They must come to the forum open to changing their own minds as well as to changing the minds of their opponents. And I think that's the way John not only participated in our commission deliberations, but I think that's the way he lived his life. I mean, he was, he had strong opinions, he really wanted people to hear him, but he listened to other people's as well. So I want to end with just one, the last conversation that he and I had on the phone before our last meeting. Um, there was a, a part of the debate about the trial design in Ebola that he and I, or at least the staff, perceived that we disagreed about. So Lizzie Fenton suggested that we, that John and I talk by phone. So we did. And we had about a 20-minute debate about clinical trial design. And you can just imagine how that debate went. And then at the end, there was this deep sigh that John had, you know, deep sigh. He said, oh, Christine, you're right, but it's so boring. <laughs> And that was John, quintessential John. That's a wonderful capturing. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else? Um, Anita. Thank you, Amy. Um, this commission has been one of the most rewarding professional experiences of my life, and John was really a very important part of the reason why I enjoyed the work of the commission so much. He was just a man full of warmth and joy and wit, and you talked about the twinkle in the eye, always, no matter what the, the conversation. Um, he was a real philosopher, um, subtle, thoughtful, big ideas were his friends. Um, if you wanted to disagree with John, you could, but you had to do so with reasons and arguments and evidence in order to be accountable and to meet his formidable uh, challenge. I thought of John as my bioethics buddy, uh, we have this wonderful, like, offline relationship, <laughs> you know, chit-chat about our aches and pains and our joys and our sorrows. And it was a wonderful um, relationship, not nearly, I'm sure, as deep as the one that Tom Murray discussed that he had with John, but we were buddies. And uh, Tom, in fact, one of the bonding experiences that John and I had was that we planned the going away party for you in Minneapolis. Uh, and it was fun because there I was in Philadelphia, John was in Charlottesville, the party was in Minneapolis. And there's me and John, like, like mom and dad, planning a wedding, trying to choose the wine and the caterer and the hors d'oeuvres. So we had loads and loads of fun and laughed and laughed and laughed. And we did that together as members of the Hastings Center uh, fellows uh, uh, council as, as you were leaving your role as CEO and executive director, director of the Hastings Center. That was great. And then to have uh, the, the commission be a place where John and I worked together as well was, was fabulous. I just want to talk about what for me was probably John's like shining moment on the commission. There's this moment which I thought of as a showstopper. We were talking about the horrible Guatemala uh, STD uh, human subject research case and when it was John's turn to talk about what was ethically problematic with the, with, the, with the research, he just decided to read an account of U.S. Public Health Service doctor deliberately swabbing a dying woman uh, with uh, STD. I think it was her eyes, her, 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 her nose, her, her mouth. And the way he did that, the way he just read that account, and just to underscore, triple underscore, the moral wrong commit, make it perfectly clear to everybody something happened that shouldn't happen. It was for me inspiring and it made me feel that I should be, we should all be bolder in our uh, willingness to call a dog a dog as he was willing to do. And I know that the media picked up on that particular moment. 
because it was just a very distinct, clear uh, moment when we could all say, yes, now we understand why what happened should not have happened. I thank John for being the bold and morally um, a righteous person that he, that he indeed was. Um, so uh, just in closing, I, I, uh, I'm going to miss John. Uh, uh, we, uh, like, uh, like uh, Christine, John and I had a conversation toward the end there. Ours was about um, human enhancements and we, we disagreed about a portion of a report that we were drafting. And John was very, uh, you know, feisty about that. He just wasn't going to back off and I wasn't inclined to back down. Uh, and we went at it a little bit, but it was such a, I mean, he's just someone you could disagree with knowing that the friendship was intact, you know, complete integrity, complete good intentions. And I think the report was much better for the conflict that we had. So thank you, John, and uh, I'm going to miss you. Nelson. So truly, we've lost a, a great in the field of bioethics, but I think you know, you're hearing from everybody the same theme. We've also lost a real mensch, I mean, a wonderful person and human being. You know, I come from a research background. I'm a research physician. I specialize in HIV, especially vaccines. I couldn't be more different in the kind of intellectual upbringing that John Aris brought, but he so, was so intellectually curious with all of us as commissioners. He was respectful of all positions. And Lord knows he would debate us to till the, till the ends of the earth. Um, but at the end of that time, he really was trying to understand how all of us could best contribute, not just how he could contribute, but how the commission could best contribute. So that intellectual curiosity, the desire to engage in an open and transparent debate where 20 minutes later you could be then at a commission dinner and everything's fine again, um, it was wonderful. He was so respectful of other people's um, input and to their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, just a wonderful man. He had a, a rapier-like like, like intellect, and I learned so much for, uh, fr from him and the other members of the commission that are truly card-carrying bioethicists. Um, and a man who brings a joyful approach to his work, especially when he debates, reminds me of the old expression that when you're wrestling with a pig, you should remember the pig likes to wrestle. <clears throat> And um, yeah, so at, at some point you just have to, uh, to, to understand, maybe it's best to get out of the grease pit. So we, we, we've lost a wonderful human being, a wonderful colleague. Um, and we all loved him deeply, even though for some of us it's only been a handful of years, for people like you it's been a lifetime. But um, he has left an indelible mark on this commission and on the field and, and uh, his memory lives on and we respect what he's done greatly. Jim. I was just going to tell a very, very quick story. Uh, first of all, I think if John were here, he'd be humbled by, I know he would be uh, uh, humbled by all this. On the other hand, he justifiably should take pride in how he elevated the discourse in this group and the quality of the work. The story is that um, it was a Christmas Eve, and I wasn't going to tell this, and so I didn't go back and figure out which one it was. It has to be uh, five years ago, maybe, uh, four years ago. Uh, he was hospitalized, actually, for an infection. Do you remember that? Yes. And, yes. Um, and I, I called him on that, on that Christmas Eve. We spoke a long time. He sounded wonderful on himself. And he even explained how the pain was such that uh, to move from the bed to the toilet, he had to crawl on hands and knees to do this. Lots of detail, um, but a great spirit. At our next meeting, I came to him and said how wonderful it was to see him and uh, how I... Uh, hoped he had, uh, was, had recovered fully, uh, made some reference to the phone call, and he had absolutely no recollection that we had had this phone call. He said, uh, he said something complimentary about the painkillers he was on, but he said nothing, <laughs> nothing about the uh, recollection of the phone call. And the reason I, I bring it after Tom, after hearing your, your comments, the, the reason I tell the story is that it was something you know, I'd called out of caring and respect for him. That probably will do us well out of caring and respect uh, for him, even though he will not be present, as he was actually not present on that Christmas Eve. But it would be, out of, uh, it would be a service of caring and respect for him to continue to hold high our standards of discourse and the quality of the work that he helped us to set. Here, here. Steve. Thank you, Amy. Uh, well, I think it's, it's evident from Tom and others' comments that, that without question, John was the most politically incorrect member of this commission. Um, oh, yeah. As someone, Nelson, like you, who 
got to know John through the commission. Uh, he was great company. It was always a joy to spend time with him. And I really got to interact deeply with John, Anita, as you described during that Guatemala and the subsequent human studies protection reports. That was the second and third report of, of our commission in, in 11. And John and I worked together on the professional standards and trial design mm -hmm. part of the, the uh, human studies report. Here the neophyte in bioethics working with the master. And it was right before Thanksgiving. Uh, John took the burden on himself, recognizing that he would be the driver of a high quality report. And it, it was so evident then to me that he had a deep sense of what is right, but also uh, compassion, sympathy, forgiveness for those who did wrong. But his forgiveness and compassion had limits. And as with your analogy, uh, I, I remember when we were discussing the historically mitigating uh, um, arguments uh, that might have been in place uh, for Guatemala. And we came across some information where John Cutler uh, had urged his superiors to extend the funding from the PHS for the Guatemala um, research, citing that we had a responsibility to the patients to make this happen. And John wrote to all of us, and I saved that, that uh, quote, he wrote, wow, this is right up there with the Tuskegee docs who claimed that they had an ethical duty to their now sick or dead patients to finish the work in order to justify their sacrifices. Um, that, that was very, I think, meaningful for, for me. I, as, as, as you all know, I live in the world of medicine. I think about the body and how it works all the time, and yet somehow recognizing the passage of time is not easier by that because of that occupation. We wear down. Uh, John was young to me. Um, we knew he had health issues, but they, they seemed to be under control. Um, and his premature death uh, reminds me of the importance of, uh, of uh, living every day to the fullest and also the importance of devoting our time to principles and causes that are worth fighting for, and John certainly did that. This is a hard group to follow, um, because I think we have captured very much of, of John. I sort of see him sitting at one of these end places and still here, and it's that smile. I mean, that, it's the twinkle that goes with it, but the smile that was most um, important, I think, to him as a person and to us. He really kept us on track uh, morally, and, and I think you've heard that from everybody. I was thinking back to the very beginning of the commission, and he didn't start right exactly at the beginning. Um, it took a little longer to get him through all the, of the things, but I remember as we were talking about what kinds of topics we wanted to discuss, he wanted to talk about the underserved. You talked about his wife. He kept bringing that up every single time we talked about what the next topic ought to be. And, um, and he really cared about access to care. He cared about taking care of people that couldn't take care of themselves. That really was very, very vital to him. The skeptical reflections, I think, uh, also sums him up. I mean, it, it, and, and the compromise. Uh, it, it's, it's all part of him, and it was part of who he was. And I think we've all taken that piece away. And I think it's, a, it's really a tribute to him and all he did for this commission and how we became friends very quickly, I think, especially with him and each of us separately. So I really appreciate it and miss him. Thank you, Barbara. Nita. <clears throat> the news of um, the news of uh, his.
passing came right as I was in the throes of um, having a newborn at home. And uh, it caused me to reflect a lot about the beginning of life and the end of life. Um, and it was difficult with so many emotions at the time to be able to even fully process that we had lost John. Um, and hearing everybody's remarks today, uh, you know, it, it, it brings all of those emotions um, to the forefront. He was extraordinarily encouraging to me. Um, I met him only when the commission started, but from the beginning he um, treated me as a friend, a colleague, and a mentor. Um, he would often give me encouraging remarks at commission meetings. You know, that was a, a great point, a great thought. Um, develop that further. That's a, a wonderful way to think about it. He would send me emails of encouragement um, if I would weigh in on issues at meetings or, or elsewhere. He, um, anytime there was a media mention, would send me a personal note. Um, and that kind of mentorship, that kind of friendship, that kind of generosity uh, is rare. And what I think is so extraordinary about how much effort he made with me and with others on the commission and in his life um, is the fact that no matter what was going on with him, no matter um, what struggles he was facing with his health or anything else in life, he was always there. He was always present. He was always willing to give more of himself. I think I'm better as a scholar, um, as a person in bioethics because of him. I think the commission's work um, and all of our lives are extraordinarily better. Just you know, thinking about our um, most recent reports on uh, the brain initiative and, and neuroethics, he really pushed us to make particularly the second report so much better. In fact, uh, to the point where I think we really went back to the drawing board and started over because of John. Um, and the quality of the work is so much better. The report, the recommendations, the deliberations were so much better. And what I found notable about that is we're here at meeting 21. Um, it's a, a lot of time and dedication over the years. And sometimes I think each of our own efforts has been at a peak or been at a uh, trough, but never John. John was always critical of the reports. He was always careful. He always brought his best thoughts and best presence. And so for that, I'll always be grateful. Um, and I will remember him fondly. I notice that we all smile much more than when you normally are thinking of someone that you've lost. And that's because he brought so much joy to all of our lives. I'll always think of him with his hat um, because every time I saw it, it just made me smile. And um, his fun hair, those, and his smile will just keep me smiling forever. So I'll miss him. Um, my life is so much better for having him in it. Thank you. Our life as a bioethics commission is so much better for having John Aris in it, and we will continue in the spirit that brings passion to our work. The lessons we learned are bring passion to our work. Respect every individual on earth, not just in word, but in deed. And lightness of being is fully compatible with depth of thinking. And thank you, Tom Murray, uh, for being our friend and his friend and for being with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Amy. Uh, so I've learned something this morning, <clears throat> as each of you have shared your reflections about John. Uh, John was a profoundly, deeply decent human being. Uh, but he had no patience with posers, frauds, users, or anyone that he thought was not a good human being. Your reflections tell me that he must have loved all of you. <laughs> uh, and that speaks well for this whole commission. So in the spirit of uh, trying to channel John, just wish you all the very best, all the commissioners, all the staff who've been so kind, the very best in your continued work and in your lives. And thank you for this privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're on. Um, thank you, and thanks to all of you. And it is in that spirit and with that challenge that we should move ahead. <laughs>